BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live. Your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Happy Monday, June 22nd, wherever and however you're connected. Great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with a man who once scored 52 points in a video game, as Jimmer Fredette, his name is Jerem Jordan. I never got into NCAA college basketball. I was more of an NCAA college football guy. But our guy uh, at BYU Hero 9, Jared King, tweeted that he and his son were finishing playing uh, the 2009-10 season. The whole season? Question mark. Whoa. In NCAA college basketball. And he accidentally shot the ball with Jimmer instead of passes it. But uh, it goes in from like 70 feet. So that's what happened. So here's some video of it. Jimmer just chucks. This was typical Jimmer circa 2011. Whee! But, um, yeah, he had the green light. So he's just – he's just, it's against Utah. I really hope that's Marshall Henderson that got bumped off the spot. Uh, yeah. And then Jimmer just nails it from uh, Jimmer Range. So, <laughs> well done. You can't go wrong with video game Jimmer. Right? Now, what's interesting about that is something similar happened in real life against Utah. Just not on that court, right? Yeah. I, was that BYU's court? I, I, that that I was in Provo. See. That was in the Marriott. That was in the Marriott Center. The, the Marriott, Marriott Center. Marriott. What is, I still don't know the answer to that, by the way. <laughs> Ever, I think it's Marriott. That episode is Marriott. coming. The how to pronounce things as they are related to BYU sports. We're getting that, our investigative team on that. As soon as we have funding for that investigative team, they will get on that. That episode is coming along. As for today, our lineup is loaded. The biggest games of each month in the 2020 BYU football season – Dual threat analyst Blaine Fowler, national champion, will join that conversation. Plus the pros and cons of an extended training camp for BYU football. And we determine the best to ever wear number 33. And as mentioned, a Jimmer Fredette edition of Who You Got. Here are today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. All of BYU's NCAA sanctioned sports teams are available for voluntary workouts on campus now. Today marks the third and final phase of reopening facilities for athletes. So good to know that they can be on campus now getting that work in because it's June 22nd. Let's be honest, in about two months, we're really close to starting and uh, may have started volleyball, soccer, and football. Football, obviously, a little further than that. Some transfer news as it pertains to BYU football. Junior cornerback Isaiah Heron has entered the transfer portal. According to other players' social media accounts, Heron is bound for an historic black college. Heron finished his sophomore season with 22 tackles, including two for loss. No, we don't know which one that is. That's the word, is that he felt that he needed to go back uh, to a school like that. And I think we can all respect that during this time, right? It's a bit of a bummer because Isaiah Heron was a guy that I thought was going to start a bunch and he had contributed and and he was one of those young guns that was now an upperclassman. So best of luck to Isaiah. And uh, I I respect that, uh, that ideology, right? The NBA draft is set for October 16th, as reported by ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Yoli Childs is the lone cougar in the mix for the draft. So now we have that date. And as we talked to Yoli Childs last week, it was evident that he is all in on the NBA, obviously. But it's sort of complicated because the other leagues say in Europe or otherwise, should the NBA not work out? Which I think some form of the NBA is going to work out for Yoli initially, at least, right? If not long term. Um, if it's not the G League and it's the actual NBA, great. But it's weird because if it doesn't work out with the NBA, then what? Because will the European teams have already figured out their rosters or will they be delayed also because of the NBA stuff? Yeah. I, I don't ha- think ha- so. Hard to know, right? Or just COVID re-upping, you know, uh, more illnesses in the fall or something. I don't know. Block out the whole night on October 16th, the double feature, because uh, while you're waiting to see if Yoli Childs gets drafted, I believe BYU's taking on Houston in college football. Wait, they're doing it on a Saturday? <laughs> no, no. That game's a Thursday night, oh, the, isn't it? Oh, Houston's a Thursday night? Sorry. Or is it a Friday? It's a it's Friday. It's a Friday. They're doing it on a Friday? Okay. Apparently. Yeah. It's a big night for BYU athletics. Uh, speaking of big nights, a guy who had several, senior middle blocker Miki Yauhiainen is named to the 2020 COSIDA Academic All-American Division I men's at-large first team. Did you follow all of that, Jerem? Why is he on the at-large team? We got a 4-0. In is computer it... science, no less. Yeah. 
Is it an academic thing or academic and athletic thing, I think? 2020 COSIDA Academic All-America Division I Men's At-Large First Team. Miki also named by Off the Block as the best to ever wear number 18 in MPSF history, joining Futi Tavana as the best to ever wear number 17. Yauhi Ainen, as Jerem just said, maintaining a 4.0 GPA as a computer science major. He hit 409 on average and Four averaged oh. over a block per set this past season. Listen, they're... Mickey's good, but he's the best to wear 18 ever. He might, he's, he's cornered the market on that number. That's fantastic. Well done. Well done, Mickey. I love Mickey. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. Let's go one month at a time for BYU football as we look ahead to the 2020 football schedule. Jerem, what are the biggest games of each month in the 2020 BYU football season. All right, let's go month by month. So uh, August, no, just kidding. September, uh, Utah. Yes. I think that one's clear. Agreed. If I had to pick a second game, though, if it wasn't Utah, I think I'd go with Michigan State. This is a, a program that's been in the college football playoff final four. Uh, Minnesota certainly had a its greatest season. I mean, they had the most wins since 04, but they had high school teams in 04, literally. Um, so that was good. Arizona State's on the right. I think Michigan State's probably the September pick if it's not Utah, but it is Utah. What do you think? Uh, I'm going to go with Minnesota besides Utah just because oh, okay. it's in that terrible fourth week spot. It's the fourth of four straight power fives. It's on the road. More power fives. <laughs> Can BYU please change the rhetoric in that week four debacle that has existed in the recent past, especially in independence. So you can change it. Just don't schedule a power five. <laughs> it's, BYU controls this. I've got that one circled. All right. How on about October. F- how about an FCS team in week four? You know? How about um, that? Well, we've learned that in November, BYU TV will host uh, or will show all of the uh, highlights from the FCS game on an annual basis, right? That's a November BYU TV thing? No, we'll do it no matter what month know, it is. I know, I know. Okay, in October, uh, I believe this is Missouri. Let's go over the games, by the way. Yeah, uh, I know we just showed them on a graphic, but Utah State, uh, Missouri, Houston, and at Northern Illinois. So clearly it's not NIU. Uh, you could argue for Utah State rival, Missouri, SEC, Houston, not so much. I think it's Missouri. I think an SEC t- team coming to Provo, which has been very rare, is uh, a big deal, albeit against a team that went 6-6 six and six and has a new head coach. And I, I think it's Missouri. I think SEC in Provo is a big deal. SEC in Provo takes the cake. That's the headliner of October. Yeah. But there is a case. All I heard was but. There is a case, really, Jaron, for any of those group of five games. Really, Northern maybe, Illinois. Don't, don't. Come on, man. Remind me, Jerem, Toledo, South Florida, road games, group of five in October Mm -hmm. last year. Those were devastating for BYU. So while it might not produce the, whoa, result like, hey, they beat those guys. What's the question? Losing those games could have the biggest ramification on the BYU football season. That Northern Illinois game has all the makings of South Florida last year. It's going to be at a... A de facto road site, so it's in Chicago, but yeah. so it's it's a de facto road game. Yeah. And BYU should win that game, just like they should have beaten South Florida. So that's the battle for Nauvoo. That's what that game that is. That one worries me a little bit because you gotta travel. It's a little bit later in the year, and BYU has already played a bunch of tough opponents. So where it is and based on the recent past, that that worries me. So that could have the worst negative impact on BYU if they lose that game. Look at the question and say with a straight face that you think it's Northern Illinois. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Like, okay, okay, okay. That okay. one has the biggest <laughs> potential negative impact. Well, so does North, North Alabama then. You know, like if we're going to go there. Realistic. No. Come on. Come Mi- on. Missouri. Come Missouri. on. Missouri. And, I said and Missouri's the biggest game. And that one's the battle for independence and far west. Yeah, I said Missouri's the biggest game. That's yes. the headliner for sure. But yeah. even losing to Utah State or Houston, those are games that BYU, because those are home, BYU is going to be facing favored to win those games. They should be favored to win those games. I, I believe so. Houston is interesting. They were 4-8 and eight last year, and we expect them to be better, obviously. They were terrible. Got a good year. football coach, Dana Holgerson. Yeah, um, he w- and he was okay at West Virginia. He didn't like do anything crazy, right, uh, as I recall. But anyway, uh, this is like church history tour in October, or uh, we're Missouri and Illinois. That's fun. Okay, on to November. Boise State seems like the logical pick here, right? It and, is. And it, yeah. Uh, I think Stanford's going to be really interesting. That is the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Bowl. 
or Mormon Bowl uh, because you have uh, the defensive coordinator, Lance Anderson, and you have several Stanford players who are members of the church who didn't go to BYU. Which Timi is, Fihoko. Which is the thing that happens. Houston Hamuli. Um, Tanner McKee, yeah. among others, right? So that's a fun one. So I think it's Boise State, but Stanford is a really interesting last game. I don't think that Stanford's going to be very good this year, by the way. I don't think Stanford's going to be super motivated in that game. They don't have a just standout running back. They had several offensive linemen grad transfer out, which is weird for them. Um, obviously, they're known for the big old lines. I think Stanford's on the decline. And so I, Boise State naturally is, is a huge game there. But Stanford's very intriguing. And it's nice to have two games in November that we are – excited about because there have been certain years where there were zero right this last year we were like okay san diego state is exciting like it's hard to get up for san diego state you know a little bit san diego state is in this month we did not bring them up until this point that's uh the second game in november but it's boise state but stanford is a really fun one that's a better november schedule than byu has maybe ever had in independence is it the best yeah that's a good question this might be the best ever because you have two quality group fives and then a power five of intrigue and stanford Okay, so I like Boise State because BYU's never won on the blue. They just, they have been... They have won so, on the blue! How dare you! Sorry. They have not They've defeated never beaten Boise, Boise State. State on the blue. They yeah, beat yeah. Western Michigan yeah. in the Zach for, Wilson game. 18 for 18, baby! The Cougars have an opportunity to Wait. do something they've never done. Win against Boise State in Boise. BYU won its last game on the blue. I just want to point that out. They got a streak. They, they're trying to make a streak. <laughs> they got a streak. <laughs> they're trying to make a streak. <laughs> trying to make it two straight on the blue. Well, they they won on the blue and they beat Boise State last year. It wasn't even hard, by the way. BYU uh, played its third string quarterback. Which, by the way, my mom informed me that Baylor and Gunnar Romney's great grandmother and my great grandmother were like tight. So that's why I connect with those guys. We ju- we just have a history there. They okay. Were, they were really good friends. We'll see if Baylor Romney's the starting quarterback there. If so, something went terribly wrong. But. He's ready to go if he needs to be. Okay, to recap, biggest games of each month. Jeremy and I are a consensus. It is Utah to open the season for yeah. September. Mm-hmm. In October, it's an SEC team in Provo at Lavelle Edwards Stadium with Missouri, although the negative impact falls on the group of five games. Not consensus on this. Like, if BYU loses to Missouri, it's not the same as BYU losing to any of those group of five teams in October. I agree, but that, uh, that's not the question. Okay, yeah. okay. and then November... We're consensus on Boise State. Mm-hmm. Stanford's fun. Listen, I want to call it the Mormon Bowl. I know I'm going to get tweets about, hey, it's Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Trust me, I know. They, <laughs> they signed the paycheck. Like, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, but it's, it's interesting because this is, this is one of the most balanced and quality schedules BYU's ever produced. They play six power fives, still t- like two too many, in my opinion. But, uh, and if you, take, if you take two out of September, we... Let, let's say BYU took two of those Power Fives out of September. They play Utah and they play, say, Minnesota, week four. And let's say they play, you know, two winnable games in there. How excited, how much more excited would you be about the schedule? Because right now we're going, hey, seven or eight. There's nothing exciting about getting up for seven or eight wins. You know what is exciting? Thinking you might win ten. That's exciting. Not Vegas saying you win ten and then you win four. That's not what I'm talking about from 2017. I remember going, when you and I were at the BYU, at the Brigham, we would get excited thinking about, oh, this team could win 10 or 11. Who knows? Maybe it's special 12. We never in our wildest dreams thought, oh, seven or eight. That's where we're at now. Just imagine what September could be like with that. But it, it's, uh, it's balanced. You have four power fives in October. You have one, or, sorry, in September, one in October, but uh, quality uh, group of fives in Utah State and Houston, right? Northern Illinois is a revenge game. The November is really compelling uh, with Boise State, San Diego State, North Alabama, live on BOTV, and Stanford. I mean, this is, this is kind of, I think, what Tom was trying to do originally. And he's been up here and said, you know, originally our idea was kind of four, uh, three or four, maybe maybe five. Power five. And ESPN comes calling, they're like, hey, you want to play this game? Yeah, well, play uh, this game? and my, my hope is that BYU does say no sometimes. Maybe if, they do. We if don't they know. say yes every time, that's an issue because then it's too hard and you don't win enough to matter we we are we are the celebrators of single dates, not an entire marriage right now, right? Yeah, the date was great. It's like sweet, that's awesome. Does it lead to anything that lasts and or is meaningful? That's what I want, right? So this this is a this is a great schedule. It's probably too great. Hopefully BYU wins uh, nine. Let's go. Well, if you have enough good individual dates, then eventually it turns into 
a consensus and going a into year 10. When's yeah. it going to happen? Well, for basketball, I'm saying like for basketball, it was, whoa, Houston. And then, it, and then they won a couple other big, the Utah State. an entirely then, different combo for me. Okay. Yeah. Then it, then yeah. it became, I'm a talking thing. about football. Okay. Yep. All right. Still single by choice. <laughs> Independent. <laughs> Our question of the day. Uh, here's what I want to ask now is like, if you could re- rebalance the schedule, where would you move games? I just told you. Okay. Weeks two and three. You move everything. Give me group five. I know. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's an interesting, intriguing conversation. What is the biggest game of each month for the, uh, the BYU football season in 2020 and why? Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. Derek Hildebrand answers Utah. So BYU can start out strong. Houston, because ESPN or whoever predicts BYU losing to them. Is that still accurate? The Football Power Index has BYU losing a home game to Houston on October 16th. I will use my internet machine. Hold on, i got to dial up. Derek Hildebrand continues, and then Boise State, November, because they are always good and tough. Hope BYU is ready this season. Okay, Houston, yeah, is a uh, 60% chance to lose. Stop yeah, it. I, I, yeah, I, I don't believe in that one. Houston, like pound for pound, is going to be more talented than BYU, I think, by a hair. Okay, so what's... Because they get power five-ish guys in Houston. They get power five leftovers or transfers, right, because of location. They're in a great spot. But that's the only... I mean, BYU is a 60% favorite, by the way, to beat Michigan State. They're down in the dumps. Okay, what about Missouri? What's BYU? Mizzou, 51% chance to win. So that's a pick of You're telling me Houston has an 11% chance Houston's better, better than to Missouri. win in Provo than Missouri does? Yeah. Come on. Very, very Come similar on. programs in terms of kind of talent. Houston, granted, a couple of years ago was really, really Hey, I'm okay calling the Houston game a toss-up, but it's in Provo, you know, and BYU is Battle of the Cougars. a favorite yeah, against Missouri, but a significant under home underdog against Houston? What do they know about Houston that we don't? Yeah. Utah, 14% chance to win. That, that feels low. really low for what Utah lost. But, <laughs> but we're all jaded. So let's go. Let's get some confidence. Let's get a win. Let's get some confidence. Coming up, the best to wear number 33 is a Super Bowl champion twice. And our dual threat analyst, a national champion, Blaine Fowler, will tell us his biggest games for each month in the 2020 BYU football season. This is BYU Sports Nation. Four. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This program is on demand. You demand it, and we give it. You can Google BYU Sports Nation podcast and subscribe, rate, and review. We are live. It is a Monday from Studio B. This is your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play. I'm Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. We are Oh, so pleased to welcome in good friend of the program, dual threat analyst, national champion quarterback, all around good man. Blaine Fowler is back with us. Blaine, it's good to see your face. How are you? I'm good. And I'm looking forward to when we can go to whatever phase that is green and I can come in there with you guys. Cause I, I'm not that far away from you. I feel like I'm close. I'm just a few blocks away, but we got to keep you guys spaced out right now for social distancing. Well, we bring Greg on, and he's literally upstairs. So we're kind of used to this workflow. <laughs> I know. I know. It seems it seems weird, but it's the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Blaine, you're looking swole. Did you just finish your workout? I did early. Well, I, I, earlier this morning. So I got I got one in finally. I haven't been able to, I've been really, really busy um, getting things back up and running, but I, I did get a workout in this morning, yes. Of course you did. Thanks that for vein, noticing. That Thanks vein's popping in your right arm. Right? It's like really big right now. <laughs> that, like that, yeah. Wow. The kids the kids call that my A vein. I don't, because it's shaped like an A. Okay. And I'll just say this. When I go to give blood or get, you know. <laughs> There's a um, snake in they there? They love me. At the Red Cross, they love me because it's really easy. <laughs> Wow. Viewer discretion advised, man. (laughs) Blaine Fowler with those veins popping on BYU Sports Nation. Okay, uh, a moment ago we just saw a screenshot of uh, the stadium at Utah, and we're talking about the biggest games of the season in or of each month of the 2020 season for BYU football, Blaine. So clearly the biggest game in September is the opener at Utah, right? Can we all agree on that? There's no question about it. It's the biggest game of the year. Um, and it just happens to be the first game, but, but absolutely, um, for the month of September, for the year, for the three year period, it's, it's all, (laughs) it's the biggest, it's, 
Yeah, that that one, I don't know how anybody can question it. And, and keep in mind, there's some big name opponents on this schedule in the month of September, but none is more important um, than that Utah game. It's the rivalry game. It's even though they don't overlap quite as much as they used to on who they're targeting and the recruiting wars, they still do go head to head uh, on some recruits. And so the games where you um, directly recruit against that team, to me, are the most important games of the season. So that makes this Utah game with all of the other things, the, the biggest game of the season. Riddle me this. Do you think Utah is the best opponent on the schedule? Boy, I don't know. I, it, Kyle's had a way of just kind of reloading that team, but but this is as much as he's had to reload that I can remember in the last six or seven years. They this last year's team was a senior laden, unbelievably talented team, and Kyle, who is the master of the understatement, even from the beginning of the year last year, said, "Boy, this is the year we've got to do some things. We're a veteran team. We're as talented as we've ever been on defense." Um, So the fact that Kyle was saying those things last year tells you a lot because he usually tries to really downplay it. And, and the evidence was how good they were, especially on the defensive side of the ball last year. And and they're losing nine of those guys. And we're talking about NFL caliber players. So as much as Utah, typically um, they don't rebuild, they just reload. I don't know how you reload that much talent. So, so I don't know that they're going to be the best team. They'll have talent, but they'll be much younger. And, you know, Michigan State's got a, a lot coming back um, this season. Minnesota, who was very good last year, ha- has a bunch coming back. Uh, there, there's several games on this schedule where they're going to play very talented teams. And I don't know enough about the young guys that are filling back in for Utah at this point, no, nor does anybody other than maybe that coaching staff. To, to say that Utah is going to be the most talented team or the best team they play this year. Blaine Fowler with us on BYU Sports Nation. As we move to October, there are some highly intriguing games here. The headliner is an SEC opponent in Missouri is coming to play at Lavelle Edwards Stadium on Saturday, October 10th. But Blaine, I can't get over the fact that BYU lost to a team like South Florida on the road last year and how devastating and deflating that loss was for BYU coming off of a bye. I look at that Northern Illinois game, and I just have bad I have nightmares about what happened in South Florida. So I think that could potentially have the most negative of an impact, but it is Missouri the headliner in October? I don't know. So you mentioned two of them. You also have Houston and Utah State in that month, right? Yeah. So – to me, of those teams, if I'm going to stick with this same thing, the same theme that we talked about in the month of September, which one of those four teams do we go head-to-head with in recruiting wars for in-state talent, and it's Utah State. And, and it'd be different if, if BYU had had no trouble with Utah State in the last five or six years, but that just hasn't been the case. Utah State has risen up to where they're thinking, wait a minute, we're on par with BYU. So to me, that's the game that means the most in-state recruiting, um, in-state bragging rights. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a battle of, of, of very familiar. You have families that are divided. Hey, our own Dave McCann's a big Utah state guy. All of his kids go to Utah state. Um, and th- there's a lot of that in this state. So to me, in-state rivalry, direct recruiting, uh, competition, um, and a game you are supposed to win. Mm. That that one to me is the most important. Now I think Missouri game has a lot of national prestige to it, and I think that's a very winnable game for BYU SEC. Uh, I'm coming in. Houston is an interesting matchup with the way they've been throwing the football around. And, and as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, don't sleep on the Mid American Conference, right? Uh, because teams coming out of there have been really physical and really good, and has given BYU a challenge. That's a really challenging month. But to me, the must win is Utah State. The last time Zach Wilson played a MAC team, he didn't even throw an incompletion. It's not even going to be hard. Not true. He lost to Toledo. (laughs) Oh, you're right, Toledo. Never mind. Yeah, we forgot about. My facetious comment was blown up by reality. (laughs) Okay, November at Boise State, San Diego State, North Alabama, live on BYU TV, and at Stanford. What's the biggest game in November? Let's go with the same thing. Boise State is the most important game, and and here's the thing. So Boise State. And, and BYU, they vie for the most relevant non-P5 school in the country, let alone in the Intermountain West, certainly in the Intermountain West. And I think that this has developed into a really nice rivalry. 
They have a long-term commitment to one another in terms of playing each other. They recognize it as a rivalry, both fan bases. And, and Boise State, even though they're not P5, I think you get P5 cachet when you beat Boise State because Boise State is respected around the country for what they've done. And so I, I think that that's the biggest game on the schedule for all of the reasons that we've been talking about. Um, San Diego State's big, too, and that's a natural old rival um, th that's gone there. And then Stanford brings a lot of national prestige. They, they haven't been great the last couple of years, but David Shaw's teams have been just devastated with injuries, especially at the quarterback position. And they had a young team last year. I expect them to be really good, especially by the end of the season. So that one would have a lot like that's like the Missouri game that gives you a lot of national prestige because Stanford's respected. But the most important game to me is Boise State for sure. The big three rivals take the three months, Utah, Utah State and Boise State, according to Blaine Fowler in September, October and November, respectively. OK, BYU, as they get set for this loaded schedule, are now trying to get through a situation where there are voluntary workouts and this whole COVID-19 situation trying to stay healthy, and the NCAA has come and said, okay, you can start your fall camp essentially in July, almost mid-July, July 20th. So, Blaine, what are the pros and cons of an extended fall camp for BYU football? Well, the pro is is that you, you have more time to develop chemistry, which you were cut short on during spring. And, and that's important for these guys because the informal leadership, you know, doesn't come from the coaching staff. It's guys that step up. And, uh, and become leaders on the team. And I think that's just so important. If you're going to have a great season, the leadership has to be internal. It has to be amongst the players. So it gives you more time to develop that. The, the big con is six weeks, you're going to be so sick of one another. Um, you're going to get, if you're not careful, and I know that Kalani's concerned about this, about just managing the workload over that period of time. Um, you have a hard time keeping kids focused for that long. You have a hard time keeping everybody healthy because a lack of a lack of focus and, and you start to get uh, the guys worn down is a recipe for injury. And, uh, and I know Kalani's concerned about that. So they've got to figure out a way to keep it fresh over six weeks. That is not easy to do. So I expect they'll, they'll have times when they won't practice and do something that's just fun to get these guys away from it and take their minds off of it and let their bodies rest a little bit. They're going to have to watch unbelievably close to see when this team is either mentally or physically fatigued and give them a break. Six weeks is a long time uh, for these guys to be together. So the, I, I think there's, there's some serious cons that you have to manage, but, but the pros are leadership development, camaraderie, chemistry, all of those things that you need to have a successful season. Blaine, you're not a doctor, but you did stay at a Holiday Inn last night, and we have you play one on TV. So let's dive into this. <laughs> How is this going to work with COVID-19 in football? Because essentially we can put as many uh, things in place to try and prevent it before we get to the game. But once you play the game, you're playing, right? And there have been a lot of so – like Eng I watched English Premier League over the weekend. They're playing, right? And then if you have any symptoms, obviously you can't go to work. Da -da -da -da. When they play, right, and someone – has a positive test right now. We're saying anyone exposed to them needs to needs to quarantine for 14 days. How how do you think that's going to work? How are we going to make it so this works and that the quarterback doesn't get a positive test because he was around everybody? Yeah, I mean, think about it. The, the quarterback is the, the and the center. Those are the two guys that handle the ball on every single solitary play, right? Um, unless you direct snap it to a running back, which rarely happens. So those two guys, one of those guys comes down with it. You got problems, right? Now you got to trace who they've interacted with, handed the ball to, I mean, everybody. And they quarterbacks that leader in the huddle, the center sets the huddle. Yeah. I mean, really anybody um, that comes down with it, it it's going to be hard because as a team, you're going through six weeks of camp, you're, you're together with one another all the time and the the likelihood that you pass something on um is is high and so I, the, yet to be determined how this is managed we're already hearing that in voluntary workouts places like lsu and and others houston have had these cases crop up yep houston have had cases crop up they've isolated the players and and they're doing everything they can to manage it um and, and what we're seeing on a national basis i just watched the press conference with Governor DeSantis the other night uh, from Florida. And, you know, Florida 
I think has been regarded as a state that's handled it pretty well, but they've got rising numbers right now. But, but what, what the governor said was it's a whole different group of people that are getting infected now. Now it's mostly young people in Florida. It's 18 to 35 where early on it was older folks and higher risk folks. Um, and, and so now all of a sudden this thing's spreading out and younger people are, are getting it, but they're not having as serious of symptoms and not as many hospitalizations because they're younger and able to fight it better. I, I don't quite know what that means. Are we ever going to get to the point where we go, okay, we've just, people are going to get it and we have to go. We're not, you know, we have to just keep doing things. I don't know that we're to that point yet, but I, I am so glad that I'm not the guy that has to make the decisions, right? Because you're walking this fine line of, in football, especially basketball, whatever it is, uh, player safety and and having to move on and get the economy going and all of that because these universities, these football programs are a primary source of revenue. They are a big part of the economy, not just of the universities, but the cities that the universities reside in, integral part of the economy. And I am so grateful I don't have to be the guy making that call because this is not an easy decision to make right now. All right, well said, Blaine, uh, our resident doctor on BYU Sports Nation, <laughs> delivering the goods once again. Okay, we'll, we'll allow you to go and study up some more before we reconvene next week. Got it. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. I'm, and I can't wait till I just get to sit with you. Can't we get a bigger desk so that we can sit six feet apart and I it, can come with you guys? It is pretty wide. We have not gone to the uh, you know nether regions here of this desk. We will explore the space. We're working on it. Yeah. I miss you guys, and I won't. I won't come in and bear hug you like I usually do and all that <laughs> stuff. I'll I'll be guarded and I'll 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 do a good job on social distancing, even though I don't usually with you guys. But I will. I promise. If you let me come back in. All right. <laughs> we'll get you. Uh, we'll get the waiver prepared. You can sign it, and then we'll move forward. All right, guys. Thanks, Good Blaine. Good to talk to you. Blaine Fowler on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. Yeah, I, I just wonder. We don't have the answers to all the questions, of course, and I don't know that we ever will, but how is it? We all want it to work, and we're trying as a society to kind of go there, but are we coming out uh, you know, too soon of, the, of this period of sort of isolation? Is, is it okay? What, what are we going to talk? What level of sickness and eventually death? Do we tolerate what is okay? Like there are a lot of ethical dilemmas to yes. figure out and it's state by state, right? Where does and, the idea of herd immunity play into all of this as well? Right. And all of this is essentially trying to cope with life until we get a vaccine, because once you get a vaccine, it's okay that you get sick in theory, but people will still die. It'll just be at a more acceptable rate. Question mark. I don't have all the answers or know what is best or what is ethically cor- correct here. There's always going to be, you know, two sides or more to this. But we all want football, and we're yes. trying to make it happen. Wherever I go, the number one question is, hey, is there going to be BOA football this season? Is yeah. there going to be, are fans going to be allowed to watch? And I'm, I was joking with Blaine about the waiver, but are we approaching a scenario where the players are going to be like, okay, there's a high chance you're going to be exposed to coronavirus? They will 100% are have you, to sign something. Are you okay with this? Yeah. And are the fans going to have to be pulled into this before entering the stadium or some disclosure that they've got to submit to the university. Oh, a hundred percent. It's it's going to get weird. I, I I mean, you could take temperatures of fans. Cougar set said 99.81% of people who die are, uh, you know, like over the age of what was it? 60, something like that. And so the young people aren't affected as much meaning death, meaning death, a positive test. Obviously you can pass that on. There's concerns with that. Right. Um, so yeah, I, there's a lot to figure out still. It feels like we're running the carts going before the horse a little bit. I, d- I don't know. I want football like the rest of us. Let's go. Okay. Coming up a whole segment about Jimmer. And speaking of Who's Jimmer, the best to wear 32 Dennis. Yeah, we, we did that. Now we're doing the best ever wear number 33 in Provo. This is BYU sports nation. Oh, Dennis. Get to know the players, coaches, and some compelling fan stories by searching Deep Blue on the BYU TV app today. All 23 Deep Blue features from last season are available on demand. Welcome back to Studio B. This is BYU Sports Nation. He is Jerem. I am Spencer. Let's whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Athletics News. All of BYU's NCAA-sanctioned sports teams are available for voluntary workouts on campus. Today marks the third and final phase of reopening facilities for athletes. Football. Junior cornerback Isaiah Heron has entered the NCAA transfer portal. According to several of his teammates' social media accounts, Heron is bound for an historic black college. Heron finished his sophomore season at BYU with 22 tackles, including two tackles for loss. 
Cougars in Pro Hoops. NBA draft is set for October 16th, as reported by ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Gilda Childs is a lone Cougar player in the mix for the draft. ESPN's John Gassaway ranks Jimmer's 2011 season as the 10th best individual season of the one-and-done era from the years 2007 to the present. Jimmer's senior season joins the ranks of Zion Williamson, Kevin Durant, Trey Young, Kemba Walker, Anthony Davis, and Steph Curry's individual seasons, just to name a few. Volleyball. Senior middle blocker Mickey Alhianen, who's coming back for another senior year, was named to the 2020 Cosada Academic All-American Division I Men's At-Large First Team after a 4.0 GPA. <laughs> he was also named by Off the Block as the best everywhere, number 18 in the MPSF. And your boy Futi Tavana was also named best wear number 17. Golf. Former BYU men's golf star and PGA veteran Daniel Summerhays choosing to retire as a touring professional following the Utah Championship this week. He told the Deseret News he will try the education system and move into a teacher mentor role rather than the touring golf pro role. He's a family guy, and it's taken a toll uh, for sure to do that. It's not an easy lifestyle. Yeah. So we wish the best to Daniel as he moves forward. When he was a student, he won the good win, and I interviewed him during a women's soccer game, and uh, I was trying to say Jack Nicholas, and I said Jack Nicholson. That was an exciting moment as a student. <laughs> because he, he broke some record that Jack Nicholas had said. Jack Nicholson. What do you think of the golden he, bear, Jack he, Nicholson? And he just smiles like, you idiot. <laughs> you got to be a straight shooter. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, something about an axe and freezing or something. (laughs) All right. Nothing better than Jack Nicholson to take on, or to take us to, rather, the best to wear it. We're counting up to number 99. We're a third of the way through exactly as of today. One number each show, determining the best athlete to wear each number at Brigham Young University. It is 33 today. The Renaissance Man, a.k.a. Todd Christensen is the best to wear 33 at BYU. This is the rare instance of a guy that was good at BYU, but was great in the pros. Todd Christensen led BYU in receiving for three years. 77 to, uh, 74 to 77 was when he was here out of Eugene. Second round pick of the Cowboys. Never actually played for the Cowboys. Made his dough with the Raiders. Led the Raiders uh, in, in catching from 82 to 86. All pro four times. I couldn't find this morning a reference for how many times someone was more times all pro, maybe Steve Young, I assume. But I, I think Todd Christensen might be the second best player ever from BYU in the NFL, which brings us to the stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Todd Christensen led the NFL in catches in 1983 and 1986. That's amazing. Raiders. That's unbelievable. And Pro Bowl five times is awesome. But all pro is the thing you really should pay attention to. Four times is incredible. So he wins two Super Bowls. Pretty awesome. He ends up being a commentator for NBC Sports, ESPN, CBS Sports Network, and The Mountain, among others. Self-publishes three books of poetry. He was known for having incredible vocabulary and diction. Yes. He appeared in an episode of Married with Children, New Hollywood Squares, went on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and was a host on American Gladiators, among many, many events on TV. He died in November 2013 due to complications during a liver uh, transplant surgery. Todd Christensen was amazing, and he was good at BYU, but he was great in the NFL. And I remember in the Smith Fieldhouse, even, you know, as as soon as, you know, 2011, 12, 13, I would be in there playing pickup basketball, and Todd would be running around on the track at his lunch hour getting some uh, work in. So he was always in great shape. Incredible person. One of the best dudes ever from BYU. Todd was on the call during what many BYU fans feel is the greatest moment in BYU football history. Beck to Harlan. He was the analyst, yeah. The and, analyst and Blaine the Fowler was the sideline reporter. Owner, How about James Space, yeah. So I got to know a lot about Todd Christensen when I became friends with his son, Tori. We just so happened to be in the same ward congregation as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Palm Springs. And I saw the Christensen's and became, and then I realized, oh, your dad is Todd. But I learned a lot about Todd and the legacy that he left on his sons and his family. And what Toby kind of, played here. What among, kind of a yep. man he was. So I, I'd n- known what an incredible football player he was, but he was an incredible father. And that was the thing he cared most about. It wasn't like about football. It was family legacy. And uh, we know his brother who works in the Simmons Center for Cancer Research. Yep. 
Dr. Christensen. Doing great work. It's there. an amazing family from top to bottom, and uh, he left an amazing legacy. So yeah, that's saying something. Like as good a football player as he was. Better guy, better father. Yeah, that won't be said at, at my funeral. I'm not like these guys. I'm not, you know what I mean? Honorable mention, Aaron Francisco played two Super Bowls, Timo Saralainen and Kevin Nixon as well. Okay, coming up, double backflips. And who you got, Jimmer or KD? I mean, KD did say that Jimmer was the best shooter in the world, so this is BYU Sports Nation. I wonder what this audience will say. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. If you want to watch some old games and some recent games, you can go to the BYU TV app and get your video on-demand fix. That man, Jim Fredette, has uh, plenty of games on the app as well. Welcome back to Studio B and BYU Sports Nation. It is time we play Who You Got? Presented by Bodyguards, protection for a life worth living. Learn more at bodyguards.com. It's simple. Who you got at number one, Jerem? Video game Jimmer for debt versus Utah or actual Jimmer for debt versus Utah? I have video game Jimmer. He has better range. He has better range. <laughs> video game Jimmer, as we learned from college basketball 2009-10. Look at this. Look at this clip. Boom. Just catches, <laughs> chucks. Footwork, awful. Two seconds in the shot clock. Nothing but net, baby. I got video game Jimmer. Jonathan Tavernari said, uh, yeah, classic Jimmer. Not passing the ball ahead to a wide open Tyler Haas and launching from 70 feet. He was feet. five feet in front of him and off balance. <laughs> I've got the actual Jimmer. He did this. He did this in real life against Utah, albeit yeah, it was yeah. closer to half court, but he actually did this on the road. What, didn't pass? Yeah. 32 <laughs> points and a half. I'm going with the real deal, man. Yeah. This happened. Why are we using my angle from under the basket? I should, it's a beautiful shot. Find that in the archives, it's man. Beautiful. Look at this guy. He's walking. And, yeah. No, he's in his face. That was a great shot. All right, number two. Who you got? Michael Smith or Jim Fredette in a free throw contest? Mike Smith. Because Mike Smith has a lot of time on his hands to just shoot free throws right now. And Jimmer doesn't? Well, Jimmer's got kids to worry about, things. Michael like, has like 12 kids. They're all grown from, up, though. From his... To, well, Mike, no, this one's not grown up. She's in the house still. Mike Smith is maybe the purest shooter from the free throw line in the history of BYU basketball. He went 60 in a row, he, he says in this video, and I believe him. It's crazy. It's so crazy how unbelievably gifted he is just as an athlete. He's like a scratch golfer. Yeah, he at can the, still at the shoot league. lights out, not just from the free throw line, but the three point line. He's the best shooter in his house. He was. Uh, he's had uh, you know a kid that played college volleyball. Um, for Long Beach State, I believe, right? Um, uh, uh, he was a high school quarterback. Like, I'm, going, I'm going Mike Smith. I think he wants that. He, he wants that pressure. But in a free throw contest straight up, I'll take Mike Smith barely over Jimmer. Oh, I, I, I don't know on that one. I can't, I can't decide. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Make a selection, Jerem. I choose Jimmer Smith. <laughs> Michael Fredette. <laughs> Oh, fine. <laughs> Number James, three. James Smith. Jeremy is 50. He is no 1 idea. million percent on the fence there. Yeah. That's tough. It's uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> Sitting on that fence. I'm going to tip over. <laughs> Number three. Who you got? 2011 Jimmer. Yeah. Or the rest of the field in the ESPN top 10 individual seasons of the one and done era. This is from John Gassaway. They had Jimmer at number 10. Mm -hmm. Trey Young, Ty Lawson, Buddy Heald, Frank Kaminsky at number five for crying out loud. Why don't you name the top four that were actually Top four, great. Kevin Durant, Anthony Davis, Steph Curry, Zion Williams. Oh, there it is, yeah. But there are some other names in there. You can already tell where I'm going to this that are ahead of Jimmer. Who, who you got, the field oh, or Jimmer? Listen, I love the Jimmer. I've been to Glens Falls twice. I was the sideline reporter for us during that season. I love Jimmer. That was amazing. The field is way better. Like, if collectively, um, no, I think the top four are better than Jimmer. I would put Jimmer Sr. at five on this Yes, list. so would I. That's where I would put it. I, I, look, I looked it up, and what Jimmer did was special. Top five team at one point, Sweet 16. There were two underclassmen NBA players with Kyle Collinsworth and Brandon Davies, but no one else helped carry the load offensively like Jimmer Fredette. Like, he carried the There were great role players on that team who became excellent players in their own right. Like, Noah Hartsock leads the team in scoring the next year, blah, blah, blah. 
Kyle Collins with Brandon Davis playing the NBA. That was a great team. But Jimmer, what he did, the the usage rate on Jimmer and what he did for that team was better than anyone else on this list. Save Steph Curry 2008. Uh, based on Twitter principles alone and uh, things that were tweeted out like, I don't know, a decade ago, Jimmer's got to be ahead of Kevin Durant, right? Because KD was the because one that declared tweeted. him <laughs> the best shooter in the world. Best scorer in the world. Best scorer in the world, okay? In all seriousness, Trey Young, that was, that was unbelievable. His team lost in the second round. Jimmer got BYU without Brandon Davis in the Sweet 16. Ty Lawson, Buddy Heald. Ty Lawson played with a loaded team. Exactly. Why is Ty Lawson zone nine on this? Hey, Kemba Walker, I think, deserves to be top five as well. He stole March. He dominated the month of March, won the biggest championship, won the national championship as a three seed with UConn. He, he had been like 10 games to do <laughs> Like crazy. Frank Kaminsky ahead of Kemba Frank Walker Kaminsky. and Jimmer Fredette. I love me a jump hook like everybody else. Oh, I like Frank. I think he's a good personality on social media, good basketball player, but not top five. Yeah, not top five. No, no. If you, it, yeah, uh, Jimmer against the field, that's a tough, that's tough. But if it's, is Jimmer a top five season? Yes. Yes. Yes, for Absolutely. sure. Yes, in our incredibly biased opinion. Okay, coming up, today's Rise and Shadow. And our elite voice of the day as it centers on the most important gains of each month for the 2020 BYU football season. This is BYU Sports Nation. This segment of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Bodyguards, protection for a life worth living. BYU Sports Nation continues with your daily reminder. The show is available anytime on demand via the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. And the podcast is free. You can uh, Google BYU Sports Nation podcast and download it whenever you want. Our question of the day. What is the biggest game of each month in the 2020 BYU football season and why? At Hank.57 on Instagram answers, Utah, no question in September. Missouri is the most important in October because they're the only power five. Then Boise for November because of the winless record at Boise State, other than the famous Idaho Potato Bowl. Yeah, just if you specify the turf color, now it gets different, right? Uh, but that's a big game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Graydon, Bascom, Utah, Missouri, and Stanford. But really, all of them are important. We don't want to overlook anyone like we did last year. Thus, the Northern Illinois and Utah States and San Diego States. I think States. BYU should overlook. North Alabama, live on BYU. <laughs> okay, just only that opponent? Only that opponent. Our elite voice of the day presented by Sundance Mountain Resort at Nate Dunn 02. September, Michigan State. Blasphemy! October, Missouri. November, Boise State. These are all games that could make or break the season. Can That's the Utah a different game, convo. Can the Utah game not make the season for a majority of BYU fans? Yes. Make or break is a different convo than biggest oh. game. That is different. Make or break. Now you're worrying about, like you said, well, a loss, a bad loss is better than a good win or worse than a good win. You know, More the, impactful. The impact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The effect. The impact. That's a different convo. And what is it? June 22nd? We have, we have time, people. Isn't it about time? time? Yeah, we have time. Okay. Today's Rise and Shoutouts. Dax Milne gets, uh, gets mine. Double backflip. We're told this is in... Cash Valley in someone's pond. The water's green. Why is the water green, I, Dax? I think that's okay, but look at this. Double backflip and nails it. That's minimal splash, slight deduction, but I think Greg Luganis would be proud of this. Why are you jumping into the green water, Dax? I say why not? That's how I live my life. Maybe he'll come out as the Incredible Hulk. I don't know. <laughs> he Swamp can, thing. He, he, he comes back with uh, you know an extra limb. We're like, whoa, <laughs> crazy. All right. My rise and shout out goes to our guy, Brian Keel, who had one of my favorite social media posts on Father's Day. He, had, he sent out a picture and said, this Father's Day, I honor my two dads. One lost the chance to raise his firstborn son against his will. The other stepped up and filled in masterfully with all the fatherly love any kid could hope for. They will vote differently in November. They do not share the same race or religion, but this picture is when they first met. I was 25. They shared a laugh. They shared a tear rejoicing that they shared love for a son, a white man and a black man together. In the midst of growing political, social, and racial turmoil, remember we are more alike than we are different. We share the same red blood of the human race. And so I honor my two fathers, amazing examples that love conquers all bounds. That's great. That's awesome, man. I love that from Brian Keel. And uh, I'd love for Brian Keel to come back and join us at some point this football season. I think he has uh, an interesting perspective for sure. Absolutely.
All right. Our thanks to today's guest, Blaine Fowler. Okay, sorry to Dennis Pitter. Ran out of time. Jimmer is still the best part of the team. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter. He's not behind. Instagram and Facebook. Use hashtag BYUS. For Jerem Jordan, I am Spencer Linton. Special shout-out to Jacob Cottle. We love you, Jacob. We're thinking of you and praying for you and your family. We'll see you tomorrow on BYU Sports Nation. Go Cougs.